Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have just an amazing show coming right up. Our first guest, Lady Hubbard, is here today to share with us her new book, The Talented Ripkins. Now, Lady has received many awards for her writings, and she was just awarded the 2017 Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence. I'm so excited that she's here today to talk to us about her new novel, The Talented Ripkins. So let's welcome to the show, Lady. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. You know, it is such a pleasure to have you here. And gosh, your book is way too much fun. (laughs) (laughs) And it's just, it what a, just a great literary work. And so I have to ask you, like, what got you started on your path of writing? Um, wow. I've always written. I'm just someone that, um, I've always loved writing. Um, I, when I was very young, I wrote a lot of poetry and, and very short stories. So I'm, I, I, I know a lot of people wind up, um, writers and they don't actually, um, say they like the act of writing, but I've actually always really enjoyed it. So, so it's been something you've been doing since you were really young and, and just have stuck with it all this time, huh? Yeah, yeah. I've I've always really enjoyed it. So um it was it took a while for me to, to get up the, the courage to actually write an entire novel, but I, I have always enjoyed um writing itself. Now, for our listeners that are new to you, so some of the writings you've done, what have those really been primarily of? Um, A lot of short fiction and um, poetry, mostly, in the past. That's what I wrote, yeah. And is there like a particular topic that really you feel drawn to more than others, or it could be about anything? Um... I, that's interesting. I, I think I've probably covered a lot of ground in my in my writing. <laughs> I write a, about a lot of very diverse um, topics. When I write short fiction and when I write poetry, it's kind of um, um, it's it's very free activity for me. So mm-hmm. so I just draw upon whatever I'm interested in at the moment. So yeah, a lot of it would be hard for me to categorize um, in terms of topics. My shorter work. Yeah. Well, and it's since you're so passionate about it, I can understand where you can kind of just get into something and let your imagination take you where it's going to take you, you know, and, and how you're saying earlier, like some people just really dread the whole writing piece. And I, I know many people like that. They're really, they'll come up with a really good article or story, but it's like, uh, they'd rather have their teeth pulled than write a, sit down and write. Yeah, I've heard people say that. I have heard people say that. But yeah, when I'm when I'm writing pieces, especially um, shorter pieces, it is pretty. the The beginnings of it are always pretty free. Like I, you know, I I use a lot of. Um, I just let myself write and see if something comes out of it. More that's more common for me than than sort of having a fixed plan. Um, a novel is, is a very different type of undertaking, of course. So um, that had to. I, I realized that really needed to be a lot more thought out. Um, but most of my shorter works just kind of came from a very open place and just like sort of allowing myself to free write, uh, until, uh, something sort of grabbed me. Mm -hmm. Now, and for our listeners that are new, um, to your wonderful work, you're not only an author, but you're also a teacher. I, I am. I am. I've been um, teaching at Tulane off and on for about 10 years now, and I, I do. I really enjoy it. What is the primarily – I know you, you, um, you're still in kind of that writing genre. What, what mostly do you focus on? In the, in the classes that I've taught? Oh, yeah. yeah. I taught, I actually, not they're not creative writing classes that I've taught there. They're, um, I taught in the Africana Studies program at Tulane and also in the theater and dance department. And so I taught a lot of um, African-American history and actually a lot of work on the performance traditions in the African diaspora. So dance and theater and uh, and music and things like that. So it's a it's it's a bit different, but it definitely has informed my my work um, in a lot of ways. My writing, um, 
yeah, someone asked me, did I need to do a lot of research for it? And I said, no, I've, I've actually been doing research for this book um, in terms of the historical information for, for a very long time, um, you know, while I was teaching and stuff like that uh, with my academic work. And also um, in terms of theater and teaching dramatic literature, I, I really enjoy writing dialogue. And I feel like I've learned a lot from um, looking at um, dramatic writing specifically in terms of, of understanding pacing and things like that in terms of uh, the dialogue of the characters. All you can do with voice is, uh, <laughs> is pretty fascinating to me. So, yeah. Well, and, and you have it so masterfully um, well written in your book. I mean, it's easy to become immersed in that road trip and and just follow along with the characters. I, I really enjoyed that. Oh, I'm so glad. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, and and so as a writer, you know, let's talk a little bit about your process. So I know different people do different things. They have to have tea. They can only write in the afternoon. They have to go for walks first. What is what surrounds your process for writing? Well, I I write pretty much every day. And I, I wake up really early. Like I, I really like to write first thing in the morning. And, um, I don't know. I enjoy it so much now. I'm sure part of it has to do with the fact that I have, um, three children. Mm -hmm. And so I, I like to get up before they do. <laughs> and I, have a, I have a little time to myself in the morning and, um, I've, I've been doing that for years and that's, that's, a. Uh, that's pretty much my routine is I try to get up uh, and have a few hours in the morning to focus on it every day. So oh, that, that's, that's a great way to start your day is by getting into that creative flow. You know, yeah. it, it's easy to see why you were teaching theater and, and dance as well, kind of, you know, um, together because it's still, it's so creative. It's still enacting all that creative parts of, of an individual. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's what I have. My, my PhD was very much focused on, um, on performance and, and things like that. So that all of that was really, I think really fed into my, um, my fiction as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, when you started on your book, the talented Ripkins, how long did it take you to, you know, get the book from like start to finish? How long did it take you to write your book? When I really sat down and said, okay, I'm going to write a novel, it, it took about four years um, after, yeah, that was the whole process took about four years. I had written the first chapter um, prior to that, uh, and it was a short story, and it was published as a short story. It's a very, very different uh, version of the first chapter. And uh, I think it actually took me a year or two to realize that I, I wanted to expand it into a novel just because I, I cared so much about the um, the characters, Johnny Ribkins and Eloise and also Meredith. And I really wanted to, I had a lot more to say about them. And then when I realized that and I sat down and, and started trying to, to figure out how to write a novel, the whole thing took about, about four years. Well, and I know that you have some very interesting inspiration behind your book. Yes, yes. But a lot of, there's a, I have a lot of inspiration behind the book, but um, most prominently because that's where the um, title comes from is an a essay by W.E.B. Du Bois called The Talented Tenth. Mm -hmm. And um, so in a certain respect, that's, that's one of the things that's going on is that the book sort of um, – is a, is is a, a manifestation of sort of my reflections on that essay and and the impact it's had and the ways in which it's been interpreted over time that that did really influence um, how I structured the book and a lot of the content as well. So and there's some per, there's other things going on in there as well because in terms of the specific character um, Johnny Ribkins I, I have said it's true he's very much um, related to my my own grandfather I got a lot of inspiration for that character from my own grandfather specifically so oh, that and you know and so you also I mean they've got some very unique superhero powers as well so how did that come into play. Well, again, it's like a, it's a merger of, of a lot of different things, but, um, 
the talented tenth. I I really wanted to make the, because that essay proposes um, he it was written in 1903 and it's a very impassioned plea for um, educational opportunities um, being made available to African Americans in the South at that time. Mm-hmm. And part of his rationale within the essay is that um, 10% of the population is endowed with sort of the natural talent, the natural gifts that will allow them to become the leadership class. And so I was thinking about that and I really wanted to make um the talent, a tangible thing. So that was part of what, where that's coming from is just trying to make, um, the idea of talent sort of tangible abilities that these characters have so that you can see both the, um, the potential and the, the potency of that idea, but also the, the limitations, because um, that's something that gets reflected on a lot uh, in the book, because they have talents, but they don't, they don't know what to do with them for the most part. So they're just trying, um, they're doing the best they can um, to figure that out. And in terms of their specific talents that they each have, that, that kind of came very naturally to me, because I, I do think they are manifestations of the the characters themselves. So it's almost like a heightening of, of who these people are because uh, it's had such an effect on how they sort of navigate the world and get through life. And, and it's a, it's a very, became a very essential part uh, in my mind of, of, of who these characters were was how they, which talents they had and how they um, utilize them. And so. how they interact with one another as well. Yes, yes, yes. Because unfortunately, they they don't always uh, get along. I actually probably rarely get along. So, <laughs> well, I think that could be a very human characteristic as well. I mean, we look at how just you know during our daily walk, how many of us are able to get along with one another and and be able to communicate well. So it was it was very well written how you had that all together. Wow, yeah, thank you. I think it's it's true too. I mean, I come from um I have a very large extended family and um that was also to talk, to try and talk about a community as as a family like you you don't you people argue all the time and, um, but they still, they still love each other. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that all felt very, um, familiar, I should say natural to me as well. (laughs) Yeah. Well, they would be so much more effective if they could work together and they, they unfortunately don't do that as often as they should. Well, it, you know, it, it follows yeah. kind of some real family dynamics there, you know, because how many families actually work, you know, really well together. Usually there's, you know, everyone's got, you know, uh, uh, some some sort of dynamics going on that makes it very interesting. Right, right. So, well, and when you pick these places that they're going on this road trip on, are these places that you've been to personally? They are. I, my grandparents, um, I moved a lot as a, as a child. I lived in a lot of different, um, cities and, and parts of the country, but every summer I would go to Florida to, to visit my grandparents. And that was, that was where I saw, uh, my extended family as well. So a lot of the places, um, in the book are, are, are pretty familiar to me. Yeah, you can you can feel that as you're reading through your book, you get that sense of, you know, it, it just it made everything so. Um, it was kind of like the cohesive part. You could feel from one location to another that there was just so much that was wrapped up in it. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. It's it it gets really there are parts of it that are are I told I was saying there's actually um embedded in here there's pretty literal directions to one of my uncle's houses and I I didn't really <laughs> I didn't realize I had been so specific until after I looked at it again after it was already um published. So but yeah. Yeah, they're very familiar places. So. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's kind of like all arrows lead to home there, you know. <laughs> right. It's true. It's true. <laughs> well, and you talked about, you know, we talked about one inspiration behind the book, and you know, you've got your your grandfather. What are some other inspirations that were kind of just blended into this wonderful book? Well, a, a lot of the other characters have. Um, 
qualities of, of people that I've known in my life, um, that I've admired. So, so certainly it's just, it's, um, yeah, I don't know. A lot is, I'm taking a lot from my family. I didn't know if you meant like mm-hmm. f- inspirations in terms of the characters or in terms of the writing or just whatever you feel like sharing. <laughs> because I, I mean, I, I found it to be so fascinating and it, gosh, you know, you just wanted to be on this road trip and go on this journey, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I, they all have all of the, um, Eloise is, it's sort of interesting because Johnny is revisiting his past, the, the uncle and, um, dealing with a lot of unfinished business that he's just, um, hasn't dealt with yet. But for Eloise, it's the first time she's meeting her family. And so they all have very specific ideas about, uh, what it means to, to live a good life and how they, how she should be using her powers and stuff like that, not powers, but just her gifts. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, and I've heard all of that before. So that, that was an inspiration. It's not (laughs) from various parts. I mean, I think it's, they all say variations of things that, that I have heard before It give advice that I've gotten before. Um, but they're all, they they all have different nuances to them. So it it is in, it's, it's very much influenced by, um, uh, just ideas about what it means to be, live a good life that's honorable and, and respectful. Um, another thing they have in common, it, they, they all reference, uh, an ancestor who called himself the rib King mm-hmm. and that's where their name actually came from. And, um, they all have different interpretations of, um, of who this man was so because none of them he's like a very shadowy figure and they all sort of see themselves as like the the continuation of his legacy but they are all talking about a different person so it's it's in that respect it was about how history people utilize history to sort of validate their um identities in the present as well so yeah just a lot going on with uh the family and and ideas about how you should live your life. So, and so since there's so much that's being drawn from your family, how, how did your family feel about the book? I'm sure they probably love it like everyone else or were they kind of going, well, I don't say that. <laughs> no, I don't think they, they don't, they, they're like, Oh, it's, they, they've been very, um, they've actually really seemed to enjoy it. They've all yeah. been very positive in, um, I don't, I don't know if people see, um, that much of themselves in it. <laughs> A lot of times I, I did take speech patterns from people and um, certain characteristics. And really, though, the characters are products of my imagination. So, for example, like I, I say, because the Johnny Ripkins does sound a lot when he talks, like mm-hmm. my um, grandfather. But my grandfather was a completely different... He, my grandfather was a, a chemistry professor. So he was he was a completely different um, person and lived a completely different life. But um, I certainly, in the way he's trying to take care of his niece, um, that feels very familiar to me. And I did borrow a lot of his speech patterns, but, but it's, I, there's not really direct correlations with members of my family in that way. Yeah. So the, the, no one's been offended yet by anything I've, I've written. <laughs> I, I think they're just, I mean, it, and when they, I'm sure they've read it, but I'm sure they love it too, because it's, it's such a fun and dynamic story. And, and parts of it, you're kind of like, well, you know, I, I can kind of see some of my family in this, in just some of the dynamics. You know? right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, well, and, you know, so we've got the family inspiration going on. Was there um, anything in, because I, gosh, I mean, being a mom and having three kids and then also writing such a phenomenal book, it must have just taken time to carve out the time to do this. Yeah, that's that's actually the that's really hard. Time is hard. Time is hard when you have um children to mm-hmm. to I mean I love my kids so much and they give me so much in other ways but I think that's why I have to get up so early that I have to have like a little time in advance to just sort of try to write because, um, it is, it's difficult. It is, it's difficult when you have, um, three children and, uh, mine are so 
spread. I have they're they're yeah. It's just a lot. It is a lot. So that's- <laughs> yeah, kids of any age could be a lot, you know, because they, you know, unless um. Yeah, we we kind of joke around with one of my friends. She dotes over her children. It's like, well, if you didn't do that, they probably wouldn't be good kids and you wouldn't be a good parent. So I get it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's true, too. They they really do give me a lot in in other ways. I I do feel very inspired um, by my having children. And and it's certainly in terms of wanting to, you know, actually sit down and write a novel. I, I always want that. Um, to, to pursue their, you know, their passions in life. And that actually really inspired me to like, well, I'm, I want to set a good example in terms of that. So it, this is actually an important undertaking. Um, and I think it's an important example for them as well. I, I think it's really important to, um, to, to sort of pursue the things that you're, you feel very strongly about. And I, I want them to do that as well. So I'm sure they're very proud of you yeah. and, and your literary accomplishments here. You know, I'm, I'm sure they really look up to, to what you've been able to accomplish with all of this. So, and um, so to kind of get back to the book a little bit, I mean, with the superhero angle to it, is there an inspiration from any comic books or, how, you know, I'm trying to figure out how these superheroes came into being because it's so, I love how you, you intertwine that. Cause you know, everyone's got gifts you know? right. and it's so great to see that, you know, a lot of times we get gifts and we are like, well, what the heck do I do with this? Or how am I supposed to uh, utilize this talent that I have? <laughs> right. Right. It's true. And I'm also, a lot of people have talents that, um, don't go recognize for, mm-hmm. for a variety of reasons. Um, I'll be honest. I did read a lot of, um, comic books and things like that, um, growing up. And I, when I thought, if I think about the, the term, the talented, um, 10th, it really did. It does sound a bit like a superhero, um, group, like the fantastic mm-hmm. four. And so part of it was just sort of playing with those, um, those ideas. And, uh, and that's how it, manifested (laughs) in my mind. So, yeah. So like in, and then there's a section that talks about, um, for a brief period of time when they all came together, all the cousins, um, and they were, um, participating in the civil rights movement and trying to use their skills or their talents together. And they, what they called themselves is the justice committee. Um, and I was kind of thinking, you know, like the justice league and things like that. Um, so yeah, it just it's just how things work out in your in your mind. So there's a lot of like overlap in terms of um, mm-hmm. meaning and references, in terms of how things evolve. Well, and do you? I mean, I could see this becoming a movie. I mean, is is there plans to make a movie of your book? Not, not as present. People ask me that though. I get asked that a lot, and I certainly that's something I would I would love to see. But no, not at present. There aren't any plans for that. So, but it's. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. So. <laughs> I I think someone should pick it up and make a movie out of this because my gosh, I mean, it's just it, it's just so much fun, so much dynamics. We don't want to give a whole heck of a lot of it away because we do want people to go pick up their own copy of the talented Ripkins and you know and just dive into that. And oh, and of course, I mean, recently you were given an award too, and I'd like to chat about that a little bit. The uh, an award? Which award? <laughs> I believe, <laughs> like which one, right? <laughs> no, no, I didn't even know like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's got to be hard to keep up with all of them. I'm no, sure. <laughs> no, I didn't mean it like that. Oh, I'm sorry. You um, last year you received the um, is a writer's award, and I yes, the Rona Jaffe. That's that it. That's yes. the one. Yes. <laughs> I'm so sure was, there are more coming, but that's the one I was talking about. So, so, yeah, that's wonderful. That is a, an award for um, for women writers, and uh, yeah, that was really, really great. It it allowed me to um, do my final revisions for this for the book. So, and it was a huge honor as well. So that was that was really wonderful. Yeah. Well, and so you know, lady, where can people connect with you? And be part of your community and learn more about your book. Right. Well, there's a lot of information on the um, Melville House website Uh because um, 
the book is 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 published by Melville House, and uh, and then I'm on I'm on Facebook, but I I I honestly I do not at present have a um I don't have a blog or anything like that. I know hey, I'm that, supposed. To- well, hey, you're so busy, you know. People have to buy the book instead of buy, you know reading the blog. So you know <laughs> that's how that goes. So yeah. well, hey, I'm connected with you on Facebook on um, your Facebook page, and I believe we're connected on Twitter too. So we'll also have that information where people can connect with you and learn more about all the good stuff you're doing. And then did you want to leave our listeners with any final thoughts? Um, no, I mean, I hope that people, I, I, there's a, there is a lot going on in this book. It's, and, and, but I mean, I do also hope people, I think it people will enjoy it. I hope people enjoy it. Um, if they read it. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's I think we covered all the bases anyway, so we're good. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Well, you know, lady, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today. Oh, no, thank you. It's yeah, nice it, it, it's been such a pleasure. We are going to pause here for a quick break and we'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient Secrets of Manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com This is Jennifer McGill. My highly anticipated new album, Unbreakable, is now available at jennifermcgill.com. Everything from power ballads to high energy jam out in your car songs, I used my highest joys and deepest pains to create empowering songs of love, strength, healing, and restoration so that you can be unbreakable too. Get your copy of Unbreakable today from jennifermcgill.com. Because who doesn't want to be unbreakable? The highly acclaimed and newly released book, The Hand Part 2 by Lynn Van Prague, Grattan, describes the journey between a psychic medium and a family who lost a son. Messages from Beyond Eternity's Gate is of love and healing. For more information, visit www.lynnvanprague-grattan.com. That's www.lynnvanprague-grattan.com. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. So I'm so excited to be introducing our next guest, Melissa Carbone, and she's here today to talk to us about her book, Ready, Fire, Aim, How I Turned My Hobby into an Empire. So Melissa is very well known for her 2013 appearance on ABC Shark Tank, where she cut the largest deal in Shark Tank history with her now partner, Mark Cuban. And since then, they've grown the largest entertainment company in the horror industry. So let's welcome to the show, Melissa. Hey, Marianne. How are you? Oh, I am fabulous. How are you doing? Fantastic. It's in the middle of the, of the Halloween season, so <laughs> not what's going on. <laughs> well, I'm sure you're busy as all get out. I mean, Halloween just passed. You, you're. I, I think you're probably getting ready for the next season, right? Yeah, absolutely. We're uh, we're already we're gonna hit the ground running for 2018 in a couple different markets. Well, and so you know, we'll talk. Gosh, I'm just. 
I'm always so curious what inspires people along the path that they take. And so why don't you share with our listeners a little bit about your inspiration to, you know, be creating these horror scenes like you do? You know, it's funny. The inspiration um, for, for the company, 1031 Productions, which is my company that, that creates the attractions, um, was mm-hmm. actually super organic. Um, I was... I was living in a very suburban part of Los Angeles uh, with my partner at the time, Allison. Um, we had been married for 10 years, give or take. And I, I started noticing these, you know, these masses of kids and their parents coming through these haunted displays that I was creating in our yard. And um, it was, I had, I had no idea it was a thing. I just thought I was this anomaly who loved creating Halloween displays. But they were getting more and more elaborate every year and um one one halloween 2008 i looked outside and you know i over the course of the night you had hundreds of people and their parents canoodling in our in our yard haunt <laughs> oh my god <laughs> yeah so um clearly clearly there was something there there was a nerve that we were jumping on you know people mm-hmm. were doing so i started i started researching the revenue behind halloween and i i come from a business background I was corporate, you know, America right out of college. Um, so I started, I just started researching the revenue trends behind Halloween. And at the time, notice it was a six and a half billion dollar industry. And um, for an industry that big, you'd you'd expect to, you know, that a clear leader would come to mind. Like if I say, you know, the beverage industry, a leader would come to mind. Or if I say mm-hmm. automotive, a leader would come to mind. So there was this multi billion dollar industry out there. I really wasn't a clear leader, so I thought, you know, maybe there's there's something being underserved here. So it it just it perpetuated more and more research and more diving into this, you know, k hole of of Halloween. Well, and um, for our listeners, so you were actually running the revenue uh, the revenue market at Clear Channel, and and doing that, and then you've got 1031 as well that um, you productions that you've been doing, and so it was like a perfect fit for all this to come together in some sense. It was, you know, at, at being at Clear Channel Entertainment for 10 years, literally was the launching pad that I that I needed, you know, my like learning ground, I guess, to mm-hmm. um, you know, to understand all the pieces of managing money, paying money, expenses versus revenue, managing people. Um, all of the principles that go along with, you know, being able to communicate internally and externally in an organization that's big and corporate and political with lots of bureaucracy. So all of that was was so educational and valuable, you know, to me starting my own my own business, at running running Clear Channel Los Angeles um, Revenue, which is the largest revenue market in the world for that company. Um, you know, meant I was dealing with a lot of money. Um, so that was essentially running on my own business. I was just under the umbrella of somebody else, so there was obviously some safety there that I that I don't have. <laughs> but, um, it didn't take you long to get that secured, though, I mean, because you went on Shark Tank in 2013 and just wowed them. Yeah, you know, I um, I hope so. I hope I wowed them. I I did go on in 2013. It was it was more of a I actually didn't expect that I'd get a deal. Um, I had been in touch with Shark Tank a couple years prior. They had they had reached out to us to see if we would do do a show. And at the time, I didn't want to because I didn't I didn't want to sell a piece of the company. We were doing pretty well on mm-hmm. our own. And um, when they reached out, when they reached out again, it might have even been the third time that they reached out. At that point, I was interested in, in expanding, and I knew that, you know, deal or not, being on a platform that's reaching millions of people um, could be a bad thing. So yeah. I decided to go on the show, and, you know, but that that was what perpetuated the, the high ask prices. I knew that if I was going to get a deal, it had to be a deal that I could live with that, um, you know, gave me the, the funds that I needed to execute, you know, the expansion, or at least do it, you know, in an expedited way. So, um that's where the, the $2 million ask came for, which ended up being the largest deal in the history of the show. And it didn't take long, it looked like, for them to go ahead, and, and like Mark Cuban, to go ahead and, and you know, throw his hat in the ring on that one. Yeah, I think, you know, Mark is very entertainment-focused anyway. You know, he's, um, mm-hmm. he's intrigued by entertainment models, and he loves to be on the front end of something. 
And, you know, that was, I mean, in 2013, experiential, immersive entertainment was, was just starting to become, you know, a buzzword. So th- this kind of, it fit that, that love that he has for, I think, entertainment and being, you know, being kind of a pioneer in the space. So we were poised to, to kind of take the space. And I think to this, at, at this point, we still are, you know, kind of, we're the leader as far as an entertainment company that is doing nothing but horror all year, all the time. And, um, and the experiences that we're doing, you can't find them anywhere else. So, you know, it's, it's been really fun, and, and we just we have to keep pushing the envelope to outdo our best. And, um, and that's a, it's a really fun space to be in. Well, you know, I, I know that you're known in L.A. as the L.A. Queen of Scream. I mean, so basically, <laughs> so you've got this reputation behind you that just shows, you know, how much you love what it is that you do, and it's, I always um, have laughed a little bit if you go and look at some of the videos that you've done with other interviewers. You know, most of them are on set are running off set. <laughs> oh, my gosh. True. That's actually really true. I never even thought of it that way. But, yeah, yeah, I scare everybody away. <laughs> but it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And, and tell a lot about, you know, gosh, you know, how great is it? that you can find this hobby that you're doing, something you really enjoy, and make a great living at it. It's everything. You know, I've got, it's, it's been the most life-changing experience um, I've ever had, you know. And, and the rub, you know, the thing that mm-hmm. I think most people don't understand is that it is so achievable. And I think, but it, but it, ha- it, but it appears hard, right? And it appears mm-hmm. risky and it's uncomfortable and it's changed. And there's all of these, you know, these volatile emotions and around it. And I've got to tell you, as as hard as it has been to start this company, because it is hard. There's a lot of work. You have to put a lot of elbow grease behind it. Um, being able to jump into something that you love and build it is so much more achievable than we think it is. So, um, so it's been everything to me, and it's been a huge life changer. And I think that throughout throughout this the last decade of me building this company, a lot of reoccurring themes have, you know, have been kind of thrown in front of my face about building your own um, business and creating, not even just in an entrepreneurial or business or monetary sense, like creating your best life, you know, um, being mm-hmm. on like your most extraordinary ride. And, um, and it all just starts with the choice to do it. It literally is that easy, you know? And so I... I've, I've tried to, I'm not just, you know, I, I tried to do in the book is create a lot of the reoccurring themes that I've seen over the past decade and even prior when I was at Clear Channel and kind of put them all in one place because I think we all suffer from the same hurdles. You know, we all, we all, it, it may, it manifests itself in different ways, but I think we all suffer from the same hurdles. So I, I'm so incredibly happy that I made that jump and I made that leap. Um, I get to play in Blood and Guts for a Living, which I mean, I couldn't have any more fun job. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, and, and you touched on it a little bit. We didn't talk about that earlier, but, I mean, you really had to put up a lot to make this happen when you first started to do this. You had to come up with a lot of money to get it off the ground and get it going. Yeah, I we did have to come up with a lot of money, and it wasn't even just the money that we had to come up with. We had to come up with strategies to put in place for when we didn't raise enough money. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, like, I think it's really easy to, for, for people to look at my story and say, oh, well, she worked at Clear Channel Entertainment. She was, you know, she was working in money every day. She had every advertiser that she was working with at her, at her disposal. And that's just not true. You know, it's, um, I, had, I had a skill set that was very helpful, which was, you know, marketing and advertising. Um, but finding money for, for something that has no proven track record of success, that, you know, in, in the world doesn't, you know, in the real world doesn't look like it has any validity at this point, nobody's going to throw hundreds of thousands of dollars at you. It doesn't matter who you are, you know. Mm-hmm. Only maybe, yeah. maybe if you're like Bill Gates or Richard Branson, they will, you know, but clearly that's yeah. not who I was. So um, it was not easy to get that money. So we actually didn't raise the money that we wanted. So we had to figure out, okay, so we don't have everything we need, so let's create a strategy to figure out how to get, you know, that task done, you know, executed anyway. So it's a lot of raising money. It's a lot of strategizing. It's a lot of thinking about things in a super untraditional way. Um, 
you know, but m- most importantly, it, it literally was the choice to do it. Mm-hmm. That's well, and most, that's most people don't even realize when you're working with companies like that, you know, most of them will have non-compete clauses in there. So it's not like you can go and reach out to all the same people that that company is doing business with. Anyway, you have to generate different sources if you're using that for your, your business. So, you know, just some things to kind of keep in mind going forward. It's, it's not always as easy as some people think, but, you know, when you put your, you know, kind of your thoughts down and go, okay, I'm going to do this, and you look for creative ways to do it, it's kind of remarkable what will happen. And absolutely, I could not agree with that statement more. It's um, I think that we underestimate what we're capable of, and there's literally a way to get everything done. You know, mm-hmm. there's never there's never a place where you're going to be standing at a wall and not be able to to figure out another direction to get around the wall. So, um, yeah, it's it's been it's been super fun and and a lesson a lesson in creativity and strategy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and so. You know, we talked about lessons. So what are some of the other surprising things that you've kind of learned along your journey of creating this empire? Well, I think, so, you know, for me, it starts with with people who have ideas. You know, I think I think we live in this world where, like, co- content is king, right? And people have mm-hmm. lots of ideas for content. And so people have ideas. And and so they're excited to talk about their ideas. They're excited to, you know, share their ideas with friends. But it's like, these, every single person on the planet has an idea. And what makes us special isn't the fact that we have an idea, which may tick some people off, but that's just the case, right? Like, mm-hmm. everyone has ideas. What makes you special is activating the idea. I always say that unless you're the heir to a fortune, marrying into wealth, or winning the lottery, um, the bridge between, you know, a, a person, a, a wealthy person with idea and a person who has an idea with no wealth is activation. And so, you know, where I, when you when you make the choice to, you know, to choose boldly, when you make the choice to do something that's going to, you know, put you on your best path, path or, or put you in the nucleus of the life that you want to live, once you make that choice, then you have to activate. You know, it's like sitting on the choice that I feel like can, can stall the process because people will say, well, I have this idea and I want to do this, but my kids, you know, maybe when they're out of the house, because I have to pay for college or, um, you know, I'll do it when I, you know, reach a certain age or I'll research and I'll research and become an expert and then I'll do it. And so we create all of these, we create all of these procrastination tools because we're like, well, when the timing is right. Well, the timing is never right. You know, the timing is, is only right right now. So to me, that the point of activating is, is where I think, you know, in a, that, that's where the cerebral spot of my book is. You know, it's, yeah. it's everything, everything needs to be activated. So when you think of all of the revolutionary collaborations of the world or you think, you know, of, of anything of anything that changed like a societal norm or an invention that changed the way we live our lives, it, it all was something that was activated and activated quickly. It wasn't an idea that was sat on for a decade, you know, while they waited for their kids to go to college. So um, to me, you know, the, the, the point of activating is um, – is a huge, huge piece of the book, and again, not just not just in a in a wealth or financial way, but even in a life, a quality of life way as well. I think that's um, so important. Hey, my goodness, you know, because it, it is easy to get in these traps where you're like, oh, but I'll wait for my kids to grow up, or I I've got these things going on right now. My life is too busy. I can't add another thing. I mean, it's always going to be busy. It's always going to be busy. And I think we get into habits of thinking ourselves into inaction, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it's like sometimes our thoughts and, and thinking too hard is our worst enemy. So to me, you know, the, the name of the book, Ready, Fire, Aim, is, you know, the essence of that. It's, it's, it's not void of direction. I'm not saying, like, fire without aiming. It's, it's saying fire and aim as you go, right? It's mm-hmm. like jump, activate. And learn as you go. Take the lessons, take the uppercuts to the jaw, get up, wipe off the blood, take take a lesson <laughs> from why you just got an uppercut to the jaw and keep moving mm-hmm. forward. You know, so um Yeah. Yeah, and I yeah, think that's, that's great. You know, especially I mean, with you definitely there would be blood involved, you know. So yeah. <laughs> 
you know, not every analogy that I'm going to use has to somehow come back to the horizontal. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this leads me to my next thing that you talk about in your book, about how people can find inspiration. And, of course, it starts with kill. Kill the fear of failure. <laughs> right. <laughs> So funny. I think I do it subconsciously. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's such a big part of your world. I can see why that would be, you know, just part of your languaging. You know, it's like, hey, we're going to go out and kill that fear. You know, I'll yeah, try to bring right? a few zombies with me to do it. But, hey, we're going to do it. <laughs> I know. It's, it's like the granular fabric genetic makeup of me at this point. So now it's just part of my vernacular. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I do say that. It's, and it's funny, right, because fear in, in the sense of this book kind of takes two minutes to say, like, like, fear is America's favorite drug, and they consume the hell out of it. Oh, which yeah. Is why, which is why horror movies are one of the top grossing genres in the entire, you know, movie industry, um, which is why Halloween attractions are so popular, which is why Halloween is such a, you know, it's a $8.4 billion industry now. So, like... Fear, fear is America's favorite drug, and we're consuming it like crazy. So in that sense, fear is this thing we crave and we go after it. But at the, and, and then in the other way, in the real-life way, fear is our biggest paralyzer. It's the thing we run away from. Mm -hmm. so, so it's just like a, it's kind of an inter interesting dynamic, you know, because in this book, I'm trying to disable fear. But in my, in my, in my attraction, I'm trying to find it and jump on that nerve in people, mm -hmm. you know. Well, and, and finding new ways, and it brings that creativity forward where you're finding new ways to, in, um, in your attractions and bringing that, feel, that fear forward. And in your book, you know, for people that, you know, not everyone's going to be having horror attractions, otherwise you'd have great competition. You know, <laughs> this other, they've got other things in their life that they are fearful of and they're trying to overcome. And your book really, can, you know, pulls that conversation forward so people go, you know, I can do this. I can follow that dream I've been wanting to follow. Yes, it's really important, um, you know, that this book conveys the message that fear of failure is the number one paralyzer. It's the crippler of all ideas. It's the, you know, it's the killer of, of like, the magic maker. But mm -hmm. um, it is, you know, failure is really only failure if you – Stay down. The only way failure ever wins is if you stay down and don't get back up and keep moving forward, you know. So I think ultimate, ultimately when we fail, we're our own worst enemy because we, we don't try again or we don't take the data of what just happened, process it, understand it, and then revise the next step forward so that it's not the same exact step, you know. And um, and I think I've had a lot of I've had a lot of moments of that in in you know the the life of this company and in the life of of being a corporate American executive at Clear Channel, where you know you take a lot of bumps and bruises, and you can you can stay there you know you can stay down and and just kind of lift your wounds or you can like really look at it and walk into what just happened. And, and, again, that's another really easy thing to do, but it feels so hard and so daunting because it's so scary. And we, you know, again, we sink ourselves into an action. We think about how hard that fall just hurt, so we don't want to try it again because it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt again just as hard or harder. When in mm -hmm. actuality, it never hurts as hard as it did the first time. You know, the yeah. first time, the first time I had a, a business failure, it hurt like hell. And... It was scary, and I, I almost did want to pack it up and not try again. But I knew I, I knew that, that, you know, I would live the rest of my life with a regret. So, um, you know, I used that data, and I moved forward and did things differently and tried to examine, you know, where the, why the sale happened and came back again. And now, you know, that was in 2011. Now we're in 2017 or, yes, 17, going into 2018 planning and we've had other things that have that have kind of been a punch in the gut that that were bigger were bigger um, were bigger fails I guess but they didn't feel as big because I knew how to recover from them now because I've done it one time mm -hmm. you know and yeah I think that so. one thing being a, an entrepreneur from the corporate world kind of teaches us how to 
look at the failures that we have and reevaluate them and kind of learn and grow from that because I mean when you're when you're working in the corporate world you you have that I mean you've got to you got to figure out how to do it better you can't just like okay I quit I leave <laughs> yeah exactly. exactly I know imagine right imagine if we did that in our jobs yeah I mean this is kind of like you know it doesn't work but it's such great training you know for an entrepreneur because then you can take that that creative side of you and you're readjusting as you go. Yeah, it's um, it's the best information I think that you can that you can get. You know, it's the best information we can receive as entrepreneurs. When we launched the New York Haunted Hayride in 2015, it was rough. You know, like I, so the 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 fail I was referring to in the um, the last question was um, ghost ship. It was a a production oh, yeah. called Ghost Ship. We put uh, we put an actual mega yacht, created an insane asylum on it, and set it set it out to sail <laughs> into the dark <laughs> open ocean that night. Um, that was 2011. So 2015, we launched New York Haunted Hayride. And I've got to say, that was so painful because we had not taken into consideration the weather as much as we should have. Um, the content of the Haunted Hayride was was not the same in New York as it was in L. There was there was just a lot of a lot of kind of miscalculations on our part, mm-hmm. and so because of that, and we were you know finding ourselves in a hamster wheel, like fixing things every single day, redoing work. I mean, we were just bleeding money because of that. Um, and you know, after the season was over, I mean, I needed I needed to like start taking antidepressants practically because I didn't I couldn't understand what had just happened. You know, this mm-hmm. was our prize. This is the mothership of 1031 production is the Haunted Hayride brand. Like, it's our it's our, our thing, like the nucleus of who we are. Yeah. And so the fact, the fact that it didn't do well and, and, you know, customers were mad at us and it was just, it hurt so badly. And I've got to say, you know, looking at that was a big wake-up call for us. And I could have just, you know, packed it in and not come back to New York because, you know, New Yorkers were mad at us, and they were telling us to go back to L.A., that we don't we don't have, like, the chops for New York. And that's hard to hear. You know, this is, like, my child's <laughs> company. Mm-hmm. But um, but it forced me to, to look at the structures, to look at how we, how we um, you know, prepared our expense lines and revenues, the location, you know, the, the, the content of the attraction. It made me look at everything in a much different way not just from my my desk in Los Angeles, California, but, like, let's dive into this market of New York and see why this thing didn't work. And, you know, we came back the next year in 2016 and mm-hmm. created that mm-hmm. thing to withstand a tornado. And, <laughs> and, and yeah. it, it became, it became I think, the most beautiful attraction that we've, we've put, you know, we put up to date. Um, the location, you know, we've, we've come to conclude that the location is not, is not ideal either, and so we're, we're going to change location next year. But all of these things, super important pieces of data. So you, you we're walking into our failure. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's, in, you know, I just love how you took that information, made it even better, and then made adjustments like, hey, you know, wow, um, you know, while this – um, we did great this year. The location probably isn't the best. So we'll, let's look at some place even better to do it at. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's important. So when do you, and, and for the hay rides that you do and all the different events you do, when do you start planning? Do you start planning right after the Halloween season? We are planning all year long. Uh, it depends on the asset. If we're talking about the haunted hay ride. We'll mm-hmm. usually we'll usually take November and December off from the Hayride to start working on our great horror movie night series because uh, that that launches in February in, in LA. So, but you know it depends on the, the attraction. But we'll hit the haunted Hayride again in like February, like late January, mm-hmm. early February. We'll start we'll start creating the the concept from like a macro view, and then we'll start granularly developing out, you know, the details of the hayride all through March, April. By May, it should be it should be locked up and done from a concept standpoint, and then we start building over the summer. 
So wow. it's that that the yeah the hayride is a I would say eight to nine months planning process. They're so mm-hmm. big. They're they're thirty acre you know attractions and giants. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just, uh, it's just phenomenal, these events that you, um, you know, put together, and it's amazing, the origin of it. I just love your story. <laughs> so, and, of course, I love your book, Ready, Fire, Aim, and I highly suggest anyone who's, you know, just interested in turning their hobby into a, you know, into more of an enterprise for them to look at purchasing your book and having that, you know? Thanks. I yeah. I, I hope so. I mean, I hope it can be helpful for people. I've I've had really good reviews on it so far, and my ultimate goal is that it will it'll give somebody that extra push they need to kind of jump mm-hmm. into the abyss of their of their ideas. I think um you know there's a lot of a lot of there's mm-hmm. a lot of lessons in the book that I think can be helpful for entrepreneurs who haven't jumped yet. But I also think there's a lot of lessons in the book for entrepreneurs who are in the middle of developing their empire, who have already even had, you know, some success and some and great success. There's there's a lot in there for them as well. So it's, I think it's, it's a good kind of read for both of those demographics. Oh. And then real quick before we get going, just a last question. I mean, how was your experience working with um, Mark Cuban as a business partner and mentor? It's great. He's still my partner, um, mm-hmm. and it's it's been great. You know, it's nice to have a resource like Mark. He's seen, he's seen every kind of business, big, small, medium. He's been involved in so many different financial ventures. He knows finance so well. Um, so that's it's been a, it's been great from a sounding board standpoint. So if you know if I if I'm questioning something or I really want a second opinion on a like a model or a logistical structure for something, he's great. He's been a great, you know, resource to, for networking. He brought Michael Rapino from Live Nation into the company as well. So um, Michael Rapino and Live Nation became a partner just the following year after Mark did. So, wow. so I have two, you know, giant partners, and, and both of them have been super, super useful. That is, it's just so exciting, and I'm, and I'm just, hey, congratulations. I'm so thrilled for you, and congratulations on your new book. And, um, you know, where can our people, you know, our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn where you're having your different events at? Uh, they can, I'm, I'm on social platforms. At Mel Carbs is my Instagram handle and Twitter handle. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a, a great way to stay involved. And then we also, all of the brands have their own handles as well. The LA Haunted Hayride and 1031 Productions have you to keep up with them. Um, with everything that we're doing, but ultimately, you know, the, my book is available everywhere now, Barnes and Noble, um, and we, you know, I, most of most of the the story will be told through through that book, and and hopefully it'll it'll resonate with people. Oh, I'm sure it will. You know, Melissa, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today. Thanks, Mary Ann, for having me and for and for giving so much love to my book and my company. Oh, of course. My goodness. I mean, how could we not? I mean, your story is so inspirational, and I know so many people are going to take so much from it. It's just the perfect inspiration for any new business owner. Well, gosh, this time always goes by so quickly. We're at the end of our time. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to tune in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary. A recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guests and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.